to this special podcast recorded on the 29th of April 2020, five weeks into lockdown with no definite end in sight. Mind you, things are changing minute by minute, so by the time you listen to this, the situation might be very different. I hope it is. It occurred to me very early on, even before lockdown started, that communication was going to be vital in enabling us to cope with the incredible change to our lives and to emerge the other side in decent shape. If you're listening to this because you're a client, a colleague, friend, somebody who's been through my training room, then you know that I believe communication is our most fundamental life skill. And that has never been more true than during these unprecedented times. Hey, I wish I had a penny for every time that word has been used. I've allowed myself one in this podcast, and that was it. So at the beginning of the lockdown, I started to gather intel from far and wide, from psychologists, journalists, coaches, business experts, specialists in conflict resolution and relationships, and friends and colleagues and clients as well. And I added to that everything that I've learned in 20 years of training people in effective communications. Here are the fruits of all that research. This is my Corona Pandemic podcast. Now, I've structured the content around three areas. Firstly, how to communicate with ourselves, how to manage ourselves Secondly, communication for the workplace, and of course that at the moment might be your kitchen table or the end of your bed. And thirdly, communicating with family and friends, whether you are locked up with them or separated from them. All along, I've included practical tools, techniques and ideas which I hope are going to be useful for these corona weeks and beyond, because actually a lot emerged that's applicable to normal life. So just as I emerge from this with a perfected banana bread recipe, wouldn't it be great if we all came out of this as more effective and skilled communicators? As I analyse the material, four themes emerged again and again. One, tolerance, kindness, empathy. That's one theme. Towards others and to ourselves. Two, and and very much leading on from that and part of it, listening, proper listening, more to that, more on that to come. Three, validating feelings, our own and other people's. Do you know, stiff upper lip, putting on a brave face, that's great, but only up to a point. And four is humour. Oh my goodness, I don't know about you, but as well as shedding tears of despair... I've shed tears of laughter, probably daily. Such amazing wit and creativity out there, whether it's the Kent family with their version of Les Mis, or have you seen the one with the toddler trying to pull up the blind and get through the door to the music of The Great Escape? Absolutely hilarious. If you haven't seen those, do have a look at them. In fact, do it now. Don't listen to the rest of this. Let's get on with our first topic then, communicating with and managing ourselves. Like you, I've been on an emotional roller coaster since about mid March. I am normally rather annoyingly upbeat and optimistic and positive, as many of you know. Not this time. I really struggled early on. I was overwhelmed by other people's disappointment and sadness. I was distressed by the fate of small businesses and individual livelihoods, my own included. I was very, very low. And the turning point for me was reading an article by David Kessler. He's one of the world's foremost experts on grief. And he suggested that what we are collectively experiencing, and what I definitely was feeling, is grief. Grief for the loss of our way of life, for economic loss, and of course, for actual loss of life. He also talks about what he calls anticipatory grief, 
a sense that something bad is going to happen, and that brings with it a loss of safety. And if we don't get that under control, if we allow our minds to ruminate about all the bad things that might happen, that can be very damaging, can't it? If you're hijacked by negative thoughts, then there's a brilliant book that you might want to have a look at, which is all about managing unhelpful thoughts. It's The Chimp Paradox by Dr Steve Peters. Also helpful in this area and mentioned by everybody is meditation, deep breathing, mindfulness. And there are several apps, aren't there? There's Calm, there's Headspace. And even the simplest techniques can help. If we find ourselves ruminating about a bleak future, we've got to get ourselves back in the present. And one thing that can help to do that is to simply name five things in the room or touch things and focus on the textures. So a hard wooden table, a silky smooth cushion, a soft fluffy blanket. Back to Kessler and grief. He talks about the stages Denial, anger, bargaining, sadness, acceptance. And he says that we can find a degree of control in acceptance. And I think that's the stage that I'm in now, because it was definitely the loss of control that I was initially struggling with. I had a nightmare more than once in which the brakes fail on a car that I'm driving downhill at speed. You don't need to be a qualified psychotherapist to understand what's going on there. I've now let go of the things I can't control, and I honestly have found that liberating. The things I can control are hand washing, distance, working virtually, lots and lots of cooking. Kessler's not the only one to suggest how important it is to externalise, to name an emotion or a feeling such as grief. Several therapists I've read speak of naming an emotion, feeling it, allowing it in and thereby letting it move through us and allowing ourselves to have that emotion without judging ourselves. Honestly, I've found that to be fascinating and really very helpful. Here are a few other practical tools from a variety of sources. See what you think. One, find three things that we're grateful for each day. I know this sounds really cheesy, but I'm willing to give anything a go. Yesterday's three things were that the sun shone, that the tulips in my garden are magnificent, and I had an especially delicious cup of coffee. Two, look for heroes. Read stories of kindness and generosity. Hurrah for Captain Tom. Three, write a diary, especially if you're struggling to express complex or tricky emotions. Four, understand our own triggers. What is it that sets us off on a downward spiral and why? Is it too much news? Is it social media? Is it people leaving their stuff lying around or not loading the dishwasher properly? Why would you put the big plates in the small gaps? And five, help others. We know this. That's why hundreds of thousands of us have volunteered. Altruism is good for the recipients, but also for the givers. I've been watching some great videos by a a mediator and conflict expert called Jane Gunn, G-U-N-N. In one of them, she talks about the Chilean mining accident in 2010, when 33 men were rescued after 69 days underground. All the analysis that's been done into how and why they survived that crisis come down to several elements, but one of them is caring for others. Now, some of us are struggling to find ways to do that because so many of us have volunteered. But even if we can't make any big gestures, I wonder if there are some tiny ways that we can brighten somebody else's day. It might be simply making eye contact and shouting a a cheery good morning across the street as we pass somebody by rather than averting our gaze. I've started doing that this week. I hope people don't think I'm creepy. 
Another factor that contributed to the Chilean miners' survival was a strong vision, belief that they would ultimately be rescued. Q reference to the Stockdale Paradox. Have you heard of it? It's fascinating. For his landmark leadership book, Good to Great, which I haven't read yet, but I'm going to, Jim Collins interviewed uh, this guy called Admiral James Stockdale. Now, he'd been in a Vietnamese prisoner of war camp for seven years. He'd been tortured repeatedly, had little reason to believe that he was going to survive, but he did. And when he was asked how and why he did and others didn't, His answer was really surprising. He said the optimists didn't make it. So the ones who said, we'll be out by Christmas, but of course they weren't, we'll be out by next Christmas, and of course they weren't, he says they died of a broken heart. They couldn't cope with the constant disappointment. They couldn't adapt to the ever-changing conditions. What Stockdale had was an unwavering faith that he would survive, but also the courage to confront the brutal facts as they were day to day. He was hopeful, but it was grounded in reality. And Collins calls this the Stockdale Paradox. And the reason it's in the book is that he says one of the characteristics of the world's most successful companies is that. And they have all suffered and survived major crises. But what does it mean in communication terms? What does it mean for us? Because we're leading teams, whether that's at home, at work, whether we're leading ourselves. It's three things, isn't it, then? It's a belief and communicating that belief that things will eventually be okay. It's accepting the reality of the situation now and communicating to our teams what they need to know. And thirdly, it's about making and communicating a plan. Thank you, Admiral Stockdale. It's worth lingering for a moment on that word optimism because it troubles me that it didn't serve those prisoners of war well. I'm a great believer in the power of positivity in communications, and in particular, the habit of leading with a positive. That's one of the tools that I teach children in schools. Now, that's not to say that we're denying the other side of the coin. It's just that we are choosing to express a positive idea first. There's no doubt, and there's evidence to support this, that positive or negative communication has an impact on how we feel and how those around us feel. I don't know about you, but I've certainly experienced this in the last five weeks. If we're not careful, we can end up with a very negative soundtrack to our lives where everything, every topic, links back to the virus. So, for example, if somebody were to mention the lockdown volley challenge that Andy Murray is leading, one response might be, oh, for professional sports people like him, it must be a disaster, all of this. It could be the end of some of their careers. Or the response could be, that sounds like fun. Shall we watch the videos or have a go? I certainly am thinking more before I respond. And it's not that we're going to be overly jolly and unrealistically optimistic, but I think it's about being careful that we're not dragging other people and ourselves down. Have you seen the meme of the panda, an image of a panda, with this text? On average, a panda feeds for approximately 12 hours a day. This is the same as an adult at home under quarantine, which is why we call it a pandemic. That's one of my favourites in the last few days, an example of the amazing wit on show in this crisis. One of the other factors in the Chilean miners' survival was humour, and it's a word that's come up repeatedly in everything that I've read and watched and listened to. 
It's widely known that laughter reduces our hormonal stress levels. It might even boost our immune system. It's good for us. But in these unusual times, it can also be a bit controversial. Uh, a colleague told me that her teenage daughter had disapproved of the Big Night In comic relief Children in Need show because she felt it was inappropriate. And I think that's a big reminder of one of the key aspects of this pandemic, that each individual is experiencing it in their own unique way. Therefore, one thing that we need more than anything else to be able to get along is tolerance, empathy. And it's not even that simple because people's emotional states are changing all the time. Mine certainly is. Catch me one day and I will love your photo of the scale model of the Titanic that you've made out of matchsticks. The next day, in a different mood, I'll want to set fire to your Titanic model. OK, here's a question. What is one of the key communication tools that is closely related to empathy and tolerance? Answer, listening. Philippa Perry, the renowned psychotherapist and author of the brilliantly entitled The Book You Wish Your Parents Had Read and Your Children Will Be Glad You Did, says, and I quote, some of us wouldn't even need therapy had we been adequately listened to. More from Philippa later, or just read the book. It really is excellent. I read an article in March on the BBC Health page by Emily Kazriel about deep listening. Which is what exactly? I hear you cry. Well, according to conflict mediator Gary Friedman... Deep listening is about being present, bringing our full attention, being open to the other person's experience of the world. The opposite, and I bet we're all guilty of this, I know I am, is preparing our response, passing judgment while the other person is speaking. So why is deep listening so valuable right now? Well, apparently it enhances the speaker's feeling of well-being makes them feel more valued, less defensive, more open to both sides of an argument. Regardless, and this is very interesting, regardless of whether the listener agrees with them. Here's how it works. There are three stages. One, ask the other person to explain their perspective. Listen without interruption, judgment, counter-arguments or solutions. That's a tricky one. Two, summarise what you've heard to check that you've understood, including the emotional texture of what they've said. Three, ask if they agree with your summary. If not, ask them to explain more until you have properly understood. Then they will be ready to hear you. NB, it still doesn't mean that you agree with them. I find this especially valuable right at the moment because we're all feeling a heightened sense of fear and a loss of control. And that means that we're more likely to take offence, to be outraged, to want to control other people and their opinions and their actions. And we can see examples of this all around us. Certainly there are some in my home. You only need to look at one of those neighbourhood forums to see anger and outrage and conflict Listening, empathy, tolerance, of course, these are just as vital in our work relationships. So let's look now at communication in our professional world. Of course, that world is transformed, bringing multiple challenges. You and your teams might now be in a household where there's homeschooling going on, where there are young children in need of attention. Others may be feeling a sense of isolation away from friends and family and colleagues especially those who've been furloughed, it's a very difficult time for them. That's why it's important for leaders to encourage people to speak out about the challenges they're facing, mental and physical. Plus, managers need to be more attuned to their team members' moods, because at the moment you can't see that sad face or that dejected body language. 
And if you're managing people who are working remotely for the first time, it's worth checking that they're not falling into some of the common pitfalls. So are they setting boundaries between home and work? Are they taking breaks? Are they prioritising appropriately? Are they managing their energy? Are they avoiding isolation? I've listened to a great interview with Matt Mullenweg. He was the inventor of WordPress. He's a tech giant and he's been running distributed, a distributed global workforce for many, many years. And it's interesting that they call it distributed, not remote. And he gave an incredible piece of advice, which I think is so appropriate for these corona times. They have long recognised that email communication, or something like Slack that you might be using, is liable to misinterpretation. There's no tone of voice, no facial expressions, no body language. It's easy to feel offended or disrespected. Something that could be solved with a smile or a wink can easily escalate. So they have a policy of API, assume positive intent on the part of the person communicating with you. Isn't that brilliant? And if the written communication does get a bit fraught, pick up the phone to de-escalate the situation. I think we can probably all apply API, assume positive intent, in our everyday lives. Communicating remotely is different and we need to adapt, just like tennis players adapt their game for different surfaces. Two key factors to think about. One, our audience is more easily distracted. They have a shorter concentration span, in part because we're all under this emotional strain. Two, we have nowhere to hide. Our skill as a communicator is in even sharper focus than in the real world. We can't get away with a lack of prep. Winging it won't do. We are more exposed. And for all of us, online communication is just harder work. It's more tiring. I'm sure you've experienced that already. A guy called Trevor Cox, who's an acoustic expert from the University of Salford, was on the Today programme the other morning talking about this. Very interesting. Audio delivered via the internet is basically poorer quality than broadcast audio, so it's more tiring for the brain, less pleasing to the ear. And if the connection is poor or dodgy, we lose concentration even quicker. Apparently Skype has done some research on this. We're having to work so hard to compensate. It's another layer of effort, as well as thinking about the content. I wonder if it's a bit like reading something that's in a, a difficult font or one that is too small. It's more tiring and we give up more easily. And it's not just about the quality of the line. On an audio or video call with more than one person, it's harder to read the cues about when to speak when you can interrupt. And that's an added layer of stress that's exhausting. Here are some quick fire technical tips for online communication, especially on video. Lighting. Get it right. Maybe invest in a lamp to look more professional. Think about the framing of the shot, the background, background noise. Maybe a headset's a good idea if you've got toddlers running around. Practice speaking into the camera. It's unnatural and it's not easy, but it's very important. Energy is your number one tool in engaging an online audience. Look for visual ways to present your content. PowerPoints need to be simpler, shorter and have more images. Verbally, we need to be more concise, offer less content, respect people's time. No room for waffle or repetition. Shorter questions, please. We need clear structure. We also need variety and contrast of content and pace and vocal style and tone to hold people's attention. Meetings, somebody needs to lead the flow of the conversation and set rules and protocols and etiquette at the outset. It'll be better for everyone. And finally, 
banter and quick-fire exchanges that work so well in the real world do not work online. Instead, we need more gaps and more pauses. And, as Matt Mullenweg pointed out, it's important to choose the right communication channel for the task in hand and the people involved. It may be that trying to brainstorm an idea on a group video call won't deliver the best outcome, certainly not if you've got introverts on the team or people who are speaking in their second or third language. After all, we wouldn't send a condolence letter by text. OK, let's move on to our final area. Communication at home with our parents, partners, children, friends. So much quality time with loved ones. Or maybe not if uh, we're living alone. In that case, it's so important to remain socially connected. I've read that being lonely actually lowers our immune system. If we're not hugging, seeing loved ones, we're producing less oxytocin. So on a chemical level, this is important stuff. There's a danger also in not getting our feelings out, and we've already heard how important it is to name, feel, and let those emotions pass through us. One client told me, and she's living alone, that she doesn't want to bother people, and she certainly doesn't want to worry her parents. She is now chatting to a friend regularly about stuff. When it comes to partners, relationship expert and psychologist Eli Finkel has some thoughts about the key to good relationships in troubled times. Three things. One is speaking out about the problems that we're experiencing in the relationship, discussing what we're good at and what we're bad at in these circumstances. The next one is about lowering expectations giving more benefit of the doubt, more sympathy, more empathy, more kindness. And this, of course, is applicable to our children too. And finally, to reinterpret their actions and words. Instead of feeling disrespected, pause, ask ourselves why they spoke or behaved like that, because it's probably more about them than what they said. Fundamentally, in, in most relationships... One person's having a bad time and the other steps in to support. The problem now is that we're both under stress at the same time, so there isn't as much bandwidth. In trying to do the best I can for my 15-year-old daughter, I'm grateful to Alicia Drummond, therapist and parent coach. I watched a really good seminar of hers and, of course, Philippa Perry in the Bright Orange book. For me, the most important tool is learning to validate other people's feelings and emotions. It's about avoiding, in response to them expressing their anxiety, avoiding placating them, distracting, criticising, ridiculing, humiliating them, using sarcasm. We've all done it. We've all responded with the, oh, don't be ridiculous, or that's really likely. I cringe now when I think about the number of times I've done that. And also, I'm, I'm trying to avoid starting too many sentences with at least. The problem is, you see, if we humiliate them, they won't share their feelings with us again. And there's a lot of evidence that suppressing bad feelings has a negative impact on our immunity. We are happier if all feelings are allowed. Thank you to Dr Tim Boyce, author of The Orchid and Dandelion, for that. Instead, what we can do is listen deeply, feel with them rather than dealing with it for them, support, soothe, but not solve. And of course, sometimes it's hard to accept feelings that we wish they didn't have, and we worry that if we do validate them, we'll make it worse. Our instinct as parents, especially now, is to fix everything. Well, do you know what? For once, we cannot fix this. We can't reinstate Glastonbury or the school trip. They're having to work through the disappointment themselves. But that is resilience, and it's one of the most important life skills. Wouldn't it be fantastic if these young people emerged from this stronger, 
and more resilient. Inevitably, there is going to be conflict. It's how we deal with it that counts. I passionately believe in the power of apologising to disarm and diffuse. It's one of the tools I teach in schools. We call it the dog ate my prep. Three simple parts. One, and this is something that actually happened to me with my daughter the other day. Part one is the apology. I am sorry that I was short-tempered with you earlier. Must include the word sorry. Two is the explanation, which is different from an excuse. I'd had an IT problem. I was very wound up. I lashed out at you. That was wrong. It wasn't your fault. Three is the remedy. It won't happen again. Please forgive me. Next time I'm grumpy, I'm going to punch a cushion or I'm going to go for a run. Eli Finkel has some useful advice about arguing as well. Easy to see where I've been going wrong all these years. Three parts again. One, tackle one issue at a time. Don't save up all your grievances and bring them out all at once. Two, Start with how the issue makes you feel rather than attacking or blaming the other person. I think this is fascinating. So, for example, I feel hurt when... dot dot dot, rather than you're so rude... dot dot dot. It's easier for them to hear how you feel rather than to be attacked or labelled. And three, reflect before reacting, especially important in these difficult times when many people are feeling more vulnerable, more fragile, more prone to take offence and to overreact. Hey, we're back to the theme that's come up again and again and again. Tolerance, empathy, kindness. So that's what I've been doing during my lockdown, as well as baking banana bread, Joe Wicks and jigsaws. Thank you for listening. I hope I've been able to offer you there some useful and practical tools and some thought-provoking material for these corona weeks and months and beyond. Good communication is important in the best of times. These are not the best of times for many, but good times will return. For now, good luck, keep well, and as Winston Churchill was fond of saying during World War II, KBO. Keep buggering on.